So, this is a DHT temperature and humidity sensor that is commonly used in Arduino projects. But I will connect that little thing to an ESP Wi-Fi module and use ESP Home firmware to configure this sensor to work in my home assistant. Also, I will calibrate this sensor and talk a little about how to use it in automations because there's something you should know. So, I will be using a DHT11. Also, everything I show in this video will be the same for DHT22. Difference between those two is just that DHT22 is a little bit more expensive and it has a wider measurement range. So, to do this, you will need a resistor, some wires, basic soldering skills, and an ESP Wi Fi module. I'm using a Wemos D1 Mini, it's my favorite. I have like 20 of those in my house right now, they were great with ESP Home firmware. You can also use another ESP board like an ESP32 or something. First, let's do the wiring and installation. You need to choose carefully where to install this sensor, if you want to have more accurate readings. Don't place it near a heat source that you are not actually measuring, like a power supply. I'm actually going to install it in the wrong place and show you how much that affects readings. Then I'm going to do it properly. Also, you should protect this sensor from water if there will be water in the surroundings because that will mess up the humidity readings. Just put it inside a case with holes or something like that. So I will add this sensor to one of my existing ESP devices that I have outside in my shed. This box already has a motion sensor and a light switch in it. I have a video in the description of how I made that light switch, check it out later. Anyways, I made four little holes in the cover plate. I put those pins in there and kept the sensor attached to this cover plate first. And this is not the best place for this sensor, but just bear with me. There are four pins on this sensor. One of those is useless, and other ones are just a power connection and the actual data output. Now you will be needing a pull-up resistor. Manufacturer recommends 4.7K. But a 1K to 10K will probably work just fine. I did find a 4.7K in some old electronics, so I'm using that. Pull-up resistor does what it implies. It pulls the signal up to the plus voltage. So we need to connect this resistor between the data pin and the plus voltage. Like that. Really simple. And that's it. Next, just add some wires. Here I'm using some old jumper wires from an old PC. You can use any wire you want and place this sensor as far as you need from the ESP module or other electronics, you actually should do that. After soldering, I secured those wires with some hot glue, I just love that stuff. Next, connect your wires to your ESP module. This sensor can work at 3.3 or 5 volts. It really makes no difference which power rail to use, I have actually tested that and it had no difference on the readings at all. Now I chose to use the D5 pin for connecting data. That is the GPIO 14. This pin is one of the best pins on an ESP8266 because it can be used as an input or an output without any limitations. If you are not sure what pin to use, I will put a link in the description where you can check out which pin is okay to use as an input. Next, I bended my sensor back up so that it won't be touching that cover. I did that because there are in fact two power supplies plus the actual Wi-Fi chip inside this box and those radiate some heat. So I needed to make sure that the sensor won't be affected by that heat. But it did. Check this out. Here's what happened when I activated a relay that is located inside this same box and that is powered by that same power supply that is also inside this box. Temperature jumped up about a degree. You can see the relay history at the bottom, showing on state in green color. Here's another example. And this is actually very surprising because that power supply is not that hot. But apparently the heat inside this box accumulated so much that it radiated through that cover and affected that sensor's readings. Or it also could be some electromagnetic reason for that, I'm not sure. Anyways, I fixed that by separating the sensor from the box with some wire. This is the proper way to do it. You need to leave it hanging in the air away from any heat source. Next, it's time to configure this sensor in ESP Home. If you will be creating a completely new ESP Home device, then check out my video in the description on how to flash ESP Home firmware and configure that device with Home Assistant. And subscribe to my channel right now. When you have your ESP Home device configured in Home Assistant, go to the ESP Home interface. That is the web user interface. Open the configuration of your ESP device and pass in this piece of code. I will put that also in the description, don't worry. Change the pin to your pin. I was using the D5. 
Choose some names for your sensors. Adjust the update interval. I have it on 3 minutes. That means that the Home Assistant will receive the latest value every 3 minutes. And you may add this line to specify which model you are actually using. Next press save. And wait till it says that it's in fact saved. Then validate your configuration. Yeah, it's valid. And upload. Now you can search for your sensors from your entities list in Home Assistant. And maybe see that they show slightly wrong values. That's because you probably need to calibrate those values. Now if you really need to know the real temperature and humidity, you need to do some calibration. But for example, I have two of these already in my house and with those I don't need to know the real values. Because I use them only for detecting changes and not to monitor the actual real values. But I will calibrate this one because it's going to be my outside temperature and humidity sensor. So I will use linear calibration. Just add these lines to your configuration. Essentially it works like this. At one end of the range you will configure the sensor to show for example 5 if the sensor is actually showing 3. And at the other end of the range you will configure the sensor to show for example 32 if the sensor is actually showing 28. And the logic will fill in everything else. I have been testing this filter and it works pretty well with a DHT sensor. What you need is to take measurements with some device that you trust, for me is this thermometer here, and write those in your configuration. First comes the value that your sensor is now showing and then comes the value that is actually the real value that you have measured with some reliable device. It's winter now here, that's pretty convenient for me, so I made all of these measurements outside and inside my house. The wider range you can measure, the more accurate the result will be. You need at least two lines for this to work, but you can make as many corrections as you would be able to measure. The more lines you will add to this adjustment, the more accurate the result will be. And like that you will have working sensors. Here I have that temperature on my Home Assistant Music Touchscreen kiosk that I'm building right now, it's not ready yet. Find my video about making this kiosk in the description, it's a pretty cool project. So about the automations. If you use the temperature values for automations, that's pretty straightforward. Nothing special there, temperature goes up, temperature goes down, but if you want to use humidity values for automations, this is what you should know. So I have another DHT11 in my bathroom, and having it like that on the ceiling is actually not a good idea, but it was the only place for that in this case. So I made an automation to turn the ventilation on if the humidity reaches 80%. That happens when I go to the shower. And this is an easy automation to turn the ventilation on. But when to turn the ventilation off? When the humidity level drops to normal? No. When you go to the shower and run hot water, steam will condensate on walls, turning back into water. And probably water will be everywhere on the floor. So you turn the ventilation on to remove steam from the room. But when you stop that, new humidity will rise from those walls and the floor again. Cause there is water everywhere and it starts drying up into the air. And after a very short time you will have the same high humidity level again. Which will trigger the automation again. And it's kind of stupid to have something just, you know, going on and off like several times to achieve one task. It's bad for the relays, it's bad for the consumers like the motor. So I resolved that by just using a delay, like a timer, to switch my ventilation off. Easy and it works great. Just see how long it actually takes to dry the whole room and use that time period to switch the automation off. Subscribe to my channel to see more of me doing and explaining random technical stuff. Please like this video. Thanks for watching.